Well, I'm sure it's not a surprise to any United community member that we're running a little behind schedule <laughs> and we're going to run over just, and I'm going to, I'm looking at Dr. Wheeler right now, five more minutes, so just bear with us. <laughs> So I am so thrilled to be with you. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Kimmy Floyd. I am the grandchild of Dorcas and James, and I am so thrilled to be here today. And I think as we finish processing tonight, many of you might be feeling some of the same things I'm feeling. We've gone all the way through the gamut of every emotion that we can possibly experience here today. So before I begin, what I would like you to do is just Get your body into a comfortable place. Put your feet down, let your shoulders fall back, close your eyes, and for just a moment, I'm going to sing the words written by Sarah Dan Jones after September 11th, 2001, called Meditation on Breathing. And if you know the words, you can certainly sing along, but otherwise, just let your body center in the words and listen to them. Breathe in. Breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So in one of my first essays here at United, and just to give you a little time frame here, I started thinking back to my first semester here, which was the fall of 2016 when I was seeking my, my master degree. And there is only one professor that's still teaching that was one of my professors, and he's actually the dean of students, Kyle Roberts. So, and Dr. Wheeler was my advisor then, and he would become my advisor at least five different times. I rotated through a whole bunch of other advisors over the years. That's how long ago it was. And when I was thinking about that, I thought, what led me here? How did I end up at United? Because when I started looking at this place, I was like a lot of other people. I was a 42-year-old person. I had been a stay-at-home parent. I had recently gone back to college, and I had got my bachelor's degree after a 20, almost 20-year 20 de delay. And I had no idea what, what was next. And I got accepted into two master's programs. One was at Metropolitan State into nonprofit leadership, and the other one was a Master of Divinity here in a brand new concentration called social transformation. And I had no idea what that meant. But that fall, I ran forward and I said, I'm going to enlist in this, this, this program, this social transformation thing, and I became part of the very first cohort. And when I started thinking about my family history, that first semester I was asked to write an essay that said, what is your family's spiritual journey? And I started thinking, well, that's a really loaded question. And I knew how I'd grown up. I could remember being in my grandmother's Nazarene church, sitting on the floor as she played the organ. And I remember growing up Missouri and Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran and all of that that came with it. And I had been in every denomination since, the, I mean, literally every denomination. I was a Methodist. I was an Episcopalian. I tried them all. And then I ended up here. And I realized if there is one part of my family's spiritual journey, that's it. They've been seekers since way before we even knew what that meant. And that includes that my family were shakers, which anyone who knows the shaker tradition means I shouldn't be standing here because shakers were not supposed to procreate. So the fact that I'm here, my aunt is here with me, I don't know how we ended up in the one branch of the family that decided that procreation thing was going to happen anyways. <laughs> But knowing that that is the history of my family, I come to United knowing I could bring all of who I am. I could show up here, and I found myself here. I discovered everything about 
who I wanted to be, what I believed about the world, what my theology was, which I had no idea when I had walked in the door. I, I mean, it was really all over the place. And I realized this is the place where I found myself. So I kept staying, and I've been here now for eight years, and this is the end of my time as a student at United. But it's not an end to our time as part of this community, as part of the chosen family we've all found here. And we will carry those things with us. So when I was thinking about all of these things, I realized that really, at its essence, what got me here, what got most of us here, is just pure determination. Hope is not some fragile thing. It's not something that you find in a fragile corner or in a place where it's breakable. Hope is something that we cling to and we keep fighting for and we keep fighting again and again and again. And that pure determination, it kept me here through everything. And it's a determination I know that many of you stay because you share it. You stayed here at United. And that meant that it was a determination that kept us all going when we had one more paragraph to read or one more short essay of 100 pages or so, <laughs> or when we had to put those finishing touches on a poem or a painting or a homily or something that we all needed to provide the next day. It kept us going even when the work of supporting us through seminary led to frayed or ending relationships when we missed our children's band concerts, and when we cut neat, short that needed vacation because we had to zoom in to just one more class. And as we face this weekend where we get to celebrate all of these things that we've accomplished, I also want to remind us that even though the goals that we set for ourselves, we can see that they're in our vision, that in the future, as you go into becoming a working minister, a working servant, a worker doing this work of following this call, you're going to need to rely again and again and again on that same determination. Because this path we have chosen, it's not for the faint of heart. You're going to have to remember who you are and who you are called to be every single day as you're in this space and as you walk out of it. It was here at United in a class with Cindy Beth that I learned that storytelling is a key element that I will use forever in my ministry. In fact, it was a good portion of my, my doctoral paper. And I want to return to a story that I go back to again and again when I need to know who I am, when I need to rediscover what this calling is for me as a minister. So through all of this theology, I'm going to tell you the story in the way I was told it as a child. And it starts like this. I have a friend named Jesus. A few of you might have heard of him once or twice. The book of John tells us that on the night that Jesus was arrested, he celebrated Passover with his disciples, his own chosen family. Jesus knew in that moment that at least one of those people would betray him, would probably lead to his death, that they would abandon their community. And he should have, he had every right to get angry to scream, to rally against the injustice of it all by attacking those people, by saying, how dare you betray me? I'm the son of God. How dare you do this? Instead, what he did is he remembered that even during great pain, challenging times, or isolation, we are to be who we are called to be at our core, at the part of us in our center, our authenticity as ministers, as religious leaders, as people heading out the doors of United, it's not just going to come in those moments that are celebratory. It's going to come in the moments that are hard, when you're not sure how you're going to get up another day, when you're not sure where the path is going to lead you. And when Jesus was faced with that moment, the book of John tells us that what he did is he went and he knelt between, 
before every person in that upper room, and he washed their feet. Now, washing feet in first century Palestine was an act of hospitality. It was a reminder to others that you cared about who they were and that you valued them. And after Jesus washed every foot, he turned to his followers and he spoke. And this is what he said. You call me teacher, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your teacher, has washed your feet, shouldn't you also ought to wash the feet of each other? So there are going to be times in the future when you, like Jesus, want to rally and scream against the injustices of the world. And I encourage you to do that. But I also need you to remember in those moments, and you need to cling to the determination and the humility to remain focused on what it means to be an agent of love and hospitality. I believe that as we leave here as United graduates, we are going out into the work of calling people back into community. Washing each other's feet is what that kind of love looks like when we go out in public. It's not about shaming them, it's not about blaming them, it's not about seeking harm, but it's about kneeling before them and washing the dirt, the grime, the literal S-H-I-T that came when you were walking around dirt roads in sandals with animals doing their business off of their feet. And that's not an easy path. It's messy. And it's going to be messy. More days than you can count. But when we take the time and the effort to wash each other's feet, we show them that they matter, even when they have forgotten it, even when we have forgotten it. And that is the work of love that we are now called forth to go and give to the world and to share. Bell Hooks reminds us that this practice of love offers us no place of safety. When we love like this, we risk hurt, loss, pain. We risk being acted upon by forces far outside of our control. But we each, as we leave here, have chosen to spread love, messy, imperfect love as a vacation. And that's a path that we follow after all of our spiritual ancestors, from Jesus to Muhammad to Anne Lee to whomever we want to identify as our spiritual ancestor. I want to tell you with every part of me that this is going to be an easy thing, but that's not the honest answer. Some days it is going to be rainbows and flowers and celebrations, and others it simply won't. And that is the truth that you have to understand. So as we leave here today, we've heard the stories, we've shared in some rituals, we're all gathering things together, and we're going to have just a few more minutes to do some sharing as a community for anyone who would like to come forward. But I urge you to reach into your spiritual ancestors and seek out those touchstones that for you remind you of who you are. And I urge you that if you forget and you can't find one, call up a member of this chosen family. Ask them, who do you see? Ask them, who do you think I am? And they'll give you an honest answer, just like they've given us an honest answer for the past however many years we've all been here. <laughs> so just know that sometimes when we are faced with a world that can be really hard, the thing we have to learn is that to rise again, sometimes we have to start by kneeling. May it be so.